This recording is uh, part of the effort to produce an e-lecture in replacement of an actual lecture. Um, it will be available in two parts, the first part covering halogenoalkane and alcohol, and of course the goal this time is to keep it as short as possible. So as you can see on the screen, that would be the learning outcomes covered in both parts. Let's move on. Right, okay, halogenoalkane, simply known as haloalkane. Um, some books may refer to it as halogenoalkane or alkyl halides. Um, not commonly found in the um, environment, in the natural world, uh, so most of which we use in our industry, such as medicine and um, agriculture or plastic making, are synthetic. So in this um, lecture, you will learn how these uh, substances are made. Of course, again, um, it's really good if you could recap and revisit um, alkane and alkene uh, that was covered in previous week that leads up to formation of halogenyl alkane. Um, I will do a brief uh, recap of it in a bit. Now let's uh, talk about naming. We have met, talk, uh, discussed naming in the past. Now uh, let's look at it. For example, this uh, uh, molecule that you see in front of you, how do we name it? Same technique, you try to identify the longest carbon chain in the structure, and then you name it in a way that your side chains uh, or your functional groups will get uh, the smallest possible number. Now you see here there's one, two, three, four, and five. I see five carbons. If I'm counting from right to left, which is one, two, three, four, five, then I'm, I'm getting for my chlorine, obviously, and I have a methyl group here, I'll get two and three, but if I'm counting from here, it's one, two, three, four. So obviously the best choice here is to count from right to left. So we have um, obviously five carbons, that would be a pentane, so pardon the handwriting, haven't used this tablet in a long time, and um, so we have at carbon number one, carbon number two and three, so that's carbon number two and that's carbon number three. I have a dichloro, and this is methyl, so alphabetically chloro comes first, so um, technically it's, um, let's do this, three hyphen, methyl and uh, it is basically 2 3 dichloro okay that's really hideous but you get the point so it's 2 3 dichloro 3 methyl pentane yeah, I'll try to have to work on this uh, board now moving on to another one um, structure that you can see here it's not appearing Okay, so simple, here what do we call this? One, two, three, or one, two, three. So it's from the left to right because chlorine um, uh, is available attached to this carbon and this carbon, we want to give it the smallest possible number. So that's one and this is two and this is three. So simple, it is one, two, dichloropropane, okay? So, and then this structure here, we can see here, the only difference between this and uh, the structure above is this is a condensed formula, and in bracket, when you see a bracket like that, and what's inside the bracket is CH3 and not CH2, normally this bracket represents a branch. So technically, this CH3 is a branch above here. So you can also might as well do it like that, and then, you know, remove this. So you, you can count one, two, three, four, five, so where you have in carbon number three, which is the bromine, if I count from the left, it will give us one, two, three. Bromine is still the same carbon number three, but then methyl will be in carbon number four. So the best choice is here to, uh, to count from right to left. So this is carbon number one, carbon number two, this is your carbon number three, four, and five. So what is it? It is simply three, bromo, um, hyphen again, and then we put a number um, two, methyl pentane, that's five carbon, okay? So it's important to remember that you have a hyphen between the number um, and alphabet, and if you're using, uh, and you have two numbers next to each other, you have to use a comma. So this is quite an important, so if you realize I've forgotten my hyphen here, so that's um, something to avoid. Um, so in short, when we are adding halogen um, to 
hydrocarbon. So some of the halogens, if you look at a periodic table, the common ones is fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. So this is the common ones. The, those below are not as reactive. So this is the common one. Um, we would have to change the name. Fluorine will become fluoro, chlorine will become chloro, bromine becomes bromo, and iodine becomes iodo, okay? So you have to change the name accordingly before adding it into the structure, okay? So that's um, chloro and fluoro, right? Okay, let's move on. That's a bit of refreshment on uh, uh, naming the structure. Now let's look at, um, again, we are, this is just to recap what we did in the past. So if you remember, alkenes um, were mainly used to synthesize halogenoalkane. alkane. Of course, we also looked at how alkane can be used um, to produce halogenoalkane, alkane, but it is not what we do in the industry because it's very hard to control uh, free radical substitution. Um, and free radical substitution also produces unwanted products. If you still remember, the termination stage produces um, a very long alkane chain, or it could produce um, um, an inorganic product, which um, is the, um, uh, it could be chlorine or bromine, uh, depending on what is the free radical, um, and only one, of, one third of the product could be a halogen or alkane. Um, whereas if you use alkene, the reactions are much easier to control because alkene, the presence of a double bond in the alkene structure allows addition to take place. And if you remember to be very specific, these reactions, this both reactions, are, we looked at it as the mechanism of electrophilic addition. Okay? So... Um, briefly, hydrogen halide, if you remember hydrogen halide, it can be as simple as HCl, and uh, we know that when this uh, reacts with this, we will end up adding um, one hydrogen and one Cl into the structure. We get our um, halogen alkane, or we could look at just um, an alkene undergoing addition uh, um, to a uh, halogen can be uh, simple as that, and we know the resulting gives us a dihalogen alkane, all right? So this is what we call as a monohalogen alkane uh, because there's only one halogen in the structure, whereas what's below here is a dihalogen alkane. Uh, this is something we have covered in the previous lecture under the alkene, so I encourage you to revisit it. Um, if you are discussing the synthesis of halogen alkane, then technically it's the product of reaction of an alkene. There is two types of reactions under halogen alkene, nucleophilic substitution and elimination. Uh, while nucleophilic substitution uh, focuses on um, substituting the most electronegative part of the hydrocarbon, for instance, uh, I'll just draw an example. So I could have this hydrocarbon structure uh, with a chlorine present in it, so that's an halogen alkene. Uh, the idea is the bond here is probably the most polar comparatively to the other bonds um, on the structure. So um, this polar bond could be substituted by another molecule. Now, elimination works on the basis that you are eliminating uh, the halogen, and usually it produces, it sort of reverses the process to produce an alkene. So we will look at both um, uh, in a while. Um, now, a bit of note on uh, the polarity of the bond that's quite important. Um, so common bond that you could see, all right, so it could be a hydrocarbon to uh, iodine or hydrocarbon to a bromine or it could be a hydrocarbon to chlorine and last it could be a hydrocarbon to F. Here R stands for any hydrocarbon chain. Now the idea is fluorine is the most polar followed by chlorine and uh, bromine and that sort of follows their electronegativity. Now the idea is the more electronegative the halogen, it forms a really strong bond. So the strength of the bond sort of increases in this direction where this is strong bond on this end, the bond becomes weak. So the stronger the bond, the idea is the harder it is for us to break it. Okay, let's move on. Let's look at each of the reaction a, a little bit in detail. So, um, oh, this is an image. Okay, right. This is a general term that we use when we talk about um, the substitution reaction. So you see that 
you will have a molecule that is generally negatively charged. So a molecule that is negatively charged is generally attracted to a positive center. Therefore, we would refer to it as a nucleophile. Okay, so that's a nucleophile. If you remember, it's a negatively charged species that's attracted to a positively charged center. And this is our halogenoalkene, so uh, a substrate which will be attacked, and that's generally the product, the mono-substituted product, and uh, this will be the species that will be displaced by this reaction. Now, keep in mind the attack occurs because this bond here, right here, is a polar bond. So when we say a polar bond, C2X, this X being a halogen, we will form a delta positive and a delta negative across the bond. So therefore, this nucleophile generally gets attracted to the delta positive, causing a displacement of the bond. Okay, don't know what just happened. Moving on. Okay, now we look at the mechanism. Nucleophilic substitution takes place in two mechanisms. We call it as um, nucleophilic substitution 1 or 2, SN1. In short, it's just SN1 and SN2. So you can use this terminology to answer an exam if the exam is asking you which, which mechanism uh, does this nucleophilic substitution takes place. You could just choose to say SN1 or SN2. Now, uh, we'll talk about the difference in a bit. So how does SN1 and SN2 uh, work? Uh, just get this animation out of the place. Right, now we look at the mechanism. I'm about to explain the SN2 uh, mechanism to you. Um, at this stage, please don't worry about what is SN2 and what is SN1. We will look at the mechanism of both, and then later, by comparison, you will see what would be the difference and how do you decide uh, which is which. Now, um, let me get the pen out. Okay. Right, so let's draw this out. So it's C2H5, it's a very simple example. Um, so that's my C2H5, and uh, I'm not gonna draw the hydrogen to keep things simple. So I put my bromine here. And then obviously this is a delta, this is gonna be my delta um, negative, and this is gonna be my delta positive, right? So what happens is now we have a nucleophile, which is the OH minus. Um, Okay, I'm going to have to redraw that because that drawing is sort of messed up. All right, we're looking at the SN2 reaction. I'm going to explain the mechanism for this part. Now, the mechanism, I'll, I'll have to draw it out. So that's BR. It's a very simple example. I'm not going to draw the hydrogen to keep things simple. And this is delta negative, while this forms my delta positive. That's a polar bond. And you have basically a nucleo, a nucleophile, which sort of forms a temporary attraction. So that sort of gives us this intermediate structure. I'm just going to draw the intermediate structure for you. So you have this carbon that is attached to the hydrogen, so we can draw it like that, and um, this is the other CH3, which is at the end of the chain. This is the carbon that was polar initially, and it's going to be attracted, so we use dotted line, so that's dotted line to indicate this is in progress. A hydroxyl being attracted to that carbon, while the bond that was already existing to the BR is further weakening. So this is an intermediate that takes place. So in a way, it is to show that the bond making and the bond breaking on both sides is happening simultaneously. So keep in mind, this is your intermediate. So this is an intermediate that is common and specific to SN2 reaction. And obviously what happens next is rather simple. BR breaks away, the bond becomes too polarized for it to exist. It sort of snaps away, leaving behind just your carbon attached to um, hydrogen and attached to hydroxyl, uh, whereas on this side, the rest remains, plus a BR minus. Okay, so if you notice what have we synthesized, we have basically made alcohol. Okay, this is one of the common way alcohol is synthesized in the industry. Of course, um, this, we are not talking about the alcohol that's used for consumption uh, or food industry that would be um, uh, produced using fermentation technique. 
How about the SN1 reaction? Now, the SN1 reaction is um, um, it's quite similar, um, but there is a difference in terms of the uh, mechanism. So we're looking at the SN1 mechanism. I need you to focus on this one. Do play it again if you have to. Now, the SN1 mechanism occurs, it's slightly more steps involved in it. So I'll just draw out this structure here. I hope you can spot that the example being used is slightly different. If you notice, this is what we call as a tertiary halogenoalkane. I'll talk about it later. We can see the carbon is attached to three other carbon and then it's attached to the BR. Same deal here. This is going to be delta negative and this is going to be delta positive. And then it's going to obviously, in this case, react um, with H2O, H2O being the um, nucleophile here. Now, how can H2O behave as a nucleophile? Keep in mind, H2O has, uh, I'll draw it out here, it has lone pairs um, attached on the structure, um, and it's also, it's a delta negative, so that causes it to naturally be attracted to delta positive, uh, to a positive center, thus behaving as a nu nucleophile. Now, this polarization causes bond breaking to take place first. So we have CH3, CH3, and CH3. So bond breaks, unlike in the previous example, you can uh, play it back after this, uh, where the bond breaking and the bond making takes place at the same time, here the bond breaks. So you form a carbocation ion in this structure and a Br minus, and then this carbocation ion is attacked by a H2O molecule, um, gets attracted to the carbocat ion, and that results in the alcohol formation. So you will get your um, alcohol, tertiary alcohol to be specific in this, taking place. So if you notice the difference between, so one, one of the hydrogen is eliminated. Keep in mind, if I were to just draw this again, um, OH, the bond between OH, this is delta negative. The bond here is already polar. So in the, fo in the formation of bond here, one of this will break away, producing this, because it can't park its electron and still hold on to two of this hydrogen. The bond becomes too extremely polar, so one of the hydrogen has to go. So that produces H+. H plus. So if you notice here, in this case, you do have a Br- minus forming here, and you have a H plus here. So if you refer to some books or some website, they could combine that and just write it down as HBr. This is an inorganic product. We don't really bother about this. The main focus is the synthesis of alcohol. Now, I want you to relook at the uh, reaction uh, that I've drawn out earlier, the SN2 reaction, or the SN2 mechanism, and then we're looking at the SN1 mechanism. I want you to realize the difference is in the intermediate Product. Now, the intermediate product in the SN2, we did not form a carbocation ion. That's because bond breaking and bond making took place at the same time, whereas in SN1, you see a formation of carbocation ion. This is something crucial for us to remember. This would be a difference in SN1 and SN2, whereas the, technically the product formed is the same, it is alcohol. So what else would be the difference between SN1 and SN2? SN1 is generally meant for tertiary halogenoalkane. Now, if you're wondering what is a tertiary halogenoalkane, very simple. You can assess your halogenoalkane. Um, I'll draw all three. Primary halogenoalkane is when a halogen is attached. So I'll just use X for a halogen attached to a carbon that has two hydrogen attached to it. That's a primary halogenoalkane, and this will be a secondary halogenoalkane where the halogen is attached to carbon that has only one hydrogen to it. And of course, the tertiary halogenoalkane, I'll, I'll just draw it down here, um, which is the halogen attached to, so that's a halogen, to a carbon that is not attached to any other hydrogen. All right. So we say this in this case, you can see comparatively here, the bond is very polar. This carbon does not get stabilization um, uh, from that many um, surrounding atom. Hydrogen is not of much help, but it has one carbon which able to sort of move its electron towards this carbon to sort of reduce its positiveness. Now, in this side, this carbon is technically more stable than the primary carbon. 
uh, because it has two other carbon that will help stabilize it. Whereas the most stable of all of them is the tertiary because it has three carbon help in stabilization. So that's what we call as a carbocation stabilized by alkyl group. Okay, that's what it means. Um, so SN1 is generally uh, takes place, um, uh, uh, the mechanism happens for tertiary halogen alkene, so practically halogen alkene that looks like that, whereas SN2 is for this two primary and secondary. Okay, so take note of this. Let's quickly look at other reactions of halogen alkene. Um, one of the first um, would be the synthesis of amine, which means we can make amines. Um, amines are basically hydrocarbons that has an amino group attached to them, which is NH2. Now, how do we make them? Simple. It's an addition of ammonia to the halogen alkane. As you can see, this is a primary halogen alkane, which undergoes SN2 reaction, which means the intermediate will not have a carbocation. So please take note of that. Um, the mechanism is pretty much similar to the mechanism of water, addition of water, where you can see that there's uh, the ammonia NH3 here behaves as the nucleophile. You can see this arrow here represents uh, its attraction to this uh, carbon, which is delta positive. Now it's not shown because we are using this arrow to show the polarization. Uh, we put delta negative here, and you can see how the um, bond between the carbon and the um, Iodine is eliminated directly, which um, forms a bond with the nitrogen. You can show this, or you can choose to show the intermediate uh, that has both um, N and I attached to it. Um, and what happens now is the bond between the hydrogen and nitrogen gets polarized, causing it to break, forming the um, amine. Okay, so that's synthesis of amines. Synthesis of ethers. Now, we don't really have to do the mechanism for uh, synthesis of ether. All you need to know is if I take uh, an ethoxide molecule, so this is uh, the name of this is a sodium ethoxide. Now, what is a sodium ethoxide? We generally can take um, a alcohol, for example, an ethanol, and we react it with a sodium metal. It will give us a sodium ethoxide. Now, this is technically a base that will react with the halogenoalkane. That would give us an ether. Now, ether is not very common, so how does ether look like? Ether looks pretty much um, like um, an ester, except um, it's obviously a different molecule. We'll have an oxygen bonded between two carbon, and on one other side is obviously in this example is CH3. So if you see a carbon COC bond, um, and that obviously is an ether. Um, another example of a similar bonding will be an ester, but an ester is basically made uh, from uh, carboxylic acid reacting with um, alcohol. Here we take an ethoxide molecule, so that's an ethoxide. Obviously it's called ethoxide because it came from ethanol that has reacted with a sodium. That gives us an ethoxide, which is this molecule here. I've just drawn a square around it. And that will react with a halogen alkene of any kind, essentially forming a bond between the carbon that was attached to the Br. So in this case, the C2H5, the O minus, would technically behave as a nucleophile. Okay, so it's similar mechanism as before. Now, let's talk about synthesis of nitrile. Now, nitriles are a product that has a CN. Now, this is a cyanate molecule, KCN, yeah, it's a potassium cyanate. Now, CN minus, obviously this is your nucleophile, and uh, the mechanism will follow the same um, as what we have discussed before this, SN1 or SN2 would depend on what kind of halogen alkene that we are using, but most commonly synthesis of nitrile uses a primary halogen alkene. So a nucleophile, so undergoes the same SN2 mechanism, and you will have a, a CN substituted into the structure. Now, this is important. This is the only reaction that would increase the number of carbon in the chain. I repeat that. It's the only reaction that will increase the number of carbon in the chain. So you can see we started off with one, two, three. This is um, uh, um, iodopropane. And once the reaction is over, it changes name. We now call this, this is one, two, three, four. This is a butanitrile. All right, it becomes a boot because now you have four carbon attached to a nitrogen. So this is a butanitrile. 
Um, now, this is a butanitrile, for example, the same example here. So you have idopropane forming butanitrile. Can butanitrile be further reacted um, into forming other things? Yes, it can undergo reduction to form aminobutane. So this is an amine uh, structure that we looked at before this. Or you can react it with an acid, a strong acid that will hydrolyze it into a butanoic acid. This is one of the common ways um, carboxylic acid are made in the industry. Um, the other uh, technique that you are, might be familiar with is the oxidation of alcohol, primary alcohol, uh, which will form aldehyde and then it forms a carboxylic acid. This is another technique that is quite common in the industry. Now we're moving on into elimination reactions um, under halogenoalkene. We're looking at the last reaction of halogenoalkene, which is the elimination reaction. An elimination reaction of a halogen alkane will produce the alkene that was originally used to create it. So you can see here, um, as you can see here clearly, um, this structure here has a propane in it, three carbons. So if I eliminate the bromine, it should technically give me the propene that would be used to form it. Now, um, you have to be very careful in this uh, 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 reaction, we generally use a very strong base, but if the strong base is in an environment of an aqueous solution, uh, which means it's in, a, in water, that will not give you an elimination. In fact, that will give you a nucleophilic substitution that will end up producing um, an alcohol. So we have to ensure that the EKOH is in an environment, non-aqueous environment, so we actually dissolve it in ethanol solution, and that will ensure elimination take place uh, to help us form butene. Now you have to clearly realize if you want to form butene, you not only have to remove a bromine, you also will have to remove one of the hydrogen um, in order to produce the double bond again. Now let's look at how the mechanism take place. Now this is E1. Uh, this elimination reaction can happen by either E1 mechanism um, or E2 mechanism, simply um, uh, uh, two different mechanisms. E1 is generally favored for tertiary halogen alkane. So if you remember what is a tertiary halogen alkane, it is where the halogen is attached to a carbon that's attached to three other carbon as an example. So let's use um, the mechanism that I'm going to show you is this. So we're going to have one carbon here, this, and probably this attached to, I'll make this a little bit longer, to a bromine. Now in the slow step of this reaction, um, the bromine will detach in the environment of ethanolic potassium hydroxide. So this bond will break, giving us a carbocate ion. Um, I'm not drawing the hydrogens to save time, uh, but I hope you get the idea because you're expected to draw all the hydrogens. I do want to keep this video short. There you go. And a Br- is obviously eliminated. Now what's going to happen in this case here you still have hydrogens attached here. You also have hydroxyl present in this solution. Now, the fact that this carbon is now a carbocate ion, the carbon surrounding it will be donating the electron to stabilize this. Now, this is an intermediate product. Obviously, in exam, you get one mark for this. Now, the stabilization is not a must show, but it's an understanding that you have to have. Due to this stabilization, the hydrogen bonding becomes much more weaker. Keep in mind, it was already a polar bond. Now it becomes weaker, and then the presence of an hydroxyl around it causes it to become further polarized. So we can show it like this. This bond becomes further polarized, so we use this two arrow. Uh, I repeat, yeah, the arrow here and the arrow here. This is sh to show that the hydroxyl is attracting the hydrogen here with its lone pair, and the bond that was already polar between the carbon and hydrogen becomes even more polar. So this leads to this hydrogen to be eliminated, causing the carbon to form a double bond with the carbon that was initially carbocate ion, and this is the structure that would come out of it. So, and of course, we can just put the hydrogens in. And so what are the uh, substances that was eliminated? Your OH would have formed a H2O, and a Br- minus will still remain. So generally, we don't show this Br- minus here, but at this stage, this product will be formed with this. 
then again this is your alkene that is formed. Um, this is E1, so E1 has an intermediate, so I repeat the intermediate is the structure with the carbocation ion which is formed when the bond between the Br and carbon in this tertiary halogen alkene breaks. Okay, now let's look at E2. E2 is much more simpler, obviously E2 is favoured for primary or uh, secondary halogen alkene. Um, primary is the most common example, so I'm, I'm going to repeat. So probably we'll just keep it simple, just three carbon again. Um, so that way, what happens, same thing, the bond here is going to get polarised. Um, well, when this bond forms polarised, this becomes delta positive. That means this carbon is going to stabilise this, this carbon here, the one I'm pointing to, is going to stabilize the carbon on the right-hand side. And that's going to weaken the bond that this carbon has with its hydrogen. So same thing that's going to happen, your hydroxyl, because it's a solution that is rich with hydroxyl, is going to be attracting uh, the hydrogen here. So we normally just show it like that with sort of a curly arrow. Um, to show that this oxygen is attracting this hydrogen and obviously this bond therefore will become weaker. So it points to the carbon here to show that this electron becomes more and more attracted to this carbon. So I repeat, first you have the polarization of this bond because of the bromine and carbon is now donating its uh, electron to stabilize, help stabilize this uh, carbon here, creating the delta positive. Um, because of the delta positive, and that polarizes the bond that this carbon has with the hydrogen, which enables it to be easily snatched away by the hydroxyl. So this will straight away give you the product where you can see uh, H2O is eliminated. We'll end up straight away. We can straight go to the product in this case, right? So, and you will have a Br minus. So you have a Br minus eliminated, your H2O eliminated, um, sorry that this doesn't look very much like a hydrogen. Right, H2O is elim eliminated because the H gets it here, and there's almost no intermediate product here. Okay, so that E2 reaction is much more simpler. I wanted to keep in mind E2 is for primary halogenoalkane and secondary halogenoalkane. E1, the one that I've just shown you earlier, just you know you can replay it, um, covers for the uh, tertiary halogenoalkane. So with this, uh, all, we have covered all the reactions uh, under halogenoalkane. Thank you.